What are you doing right now? It's you spend forty five minutes of you setting up the camera and moving things around over here, <laughs> Doctor Maxfield. What is going on? Yeah, the uh, I don't know. I don't know how to work real cameras. So how do I? Someone can teach me how to make a camera focus on you because I don't know how to do it without touching it. And I'm isn't that their autofocus feature over here? Maybe let's call somebody. Yeah, you're out of focus now. No. <laughs> Wait a minute. You serious? I thought he was trolling. What do no. you look like, Luke? D do you look in focus to you? I think so. Yeah. Okay. If you look in focus to you, then you're fine because it's recording locally. Your internet's bad, but that's fine. Oh, okay. Cool. cool. I'm not worried about it. Let's rock and roll. Yeah, All right. I am. Everyone, welcome back to Doctorly Unhinged, where we give our unsolicited and unhinged opinions. I'm Dr. Shaw. I'm Dr. Maxfield. And we have a special guest. Introduce yourself. I'm Dr. Bishra Aldaba. Board certified dermatologist and Mo surgeon. Also happens to be my business partner at the practice. I don't say partner at the practice <laughs> because it creates a lot of confusion on social media. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So today we have a lot to discuss here and we're going to do a little bit of a warm up. Get the juices flowing. That's a weird Speaking intro for what juices. we're about to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a weird intro for what we're about to talk about. So starting off, would you put it on your face? I'm going to yell out a bunch of phrases and then you're going to tell me, both of you, whether or not you would put it on your face. You ready? I want to hear Bisher's first. I want to hear his. Uh... All right. All right. First up, honey. Yes. Yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the best ingredients. Sticky, but effective. Turmeric. Turmeric. Yes. Yeah, I'd do it. I, does it do anything? But I would do it. I think it does. It does. Ginger. <laughs> I'd go with yes. I'd go with no. I don't know. I just don't. I'm with Dr. Maxfield. I'd go with no also. Yeah. It could probably be pretty irritating to the skin. All right. So the next couple ones that I'm going to shout out, it's going to sound like I'm being vulgar. I am just talking about things that people are doing on social media. So these are things that people are doing. They have done. They talk about them. And so this is why we're talking about this. So first up, menstrual blood. That would be a no. I am also on a no. We've talked about this before. Somehow this is a controversial take. Yeah, somehow this is a controversial take. Yeah, any blood that's, I don't know, any blood. I don't know. And then we have PRP and it's like, how is it different? This is why it's controversial. Yeah. But PRP is not blood. It's a component of blood. It's everything but the blood. That's it's not true. Blood, but. but if you take whole blood, right? Say yeah. you take whole blood. Now, now we're talking theoretically. Let's say you take whole blood and you don't spin it down and pull off the platelet rich plasma from it. Won't that whole blood still have growth factors in it that could then potentially be beneficial for the skin? It could, but then you have everything else. Yeah, and then you have everything else. But is that bad for you to put blood on your skin then? Or is it just wasted product, so to speak? Well, you're wasting it anyway <laughs> when you're doing PRP. I, I don't know. I think we now have just, I don't know, now we're at odds with each other. No, uh, my issue sort of with menstrual blood, which is crazy that I even have to have this discussion, is that it passes through the canal and in that process is exposed to, you know, different bacteria um, in that area, which can be obviously a spread of infection. And so, you know, pure blood, I think is a little different conversation. PRP, obviously a different conversation, but then menstrual blood to me just doesn't seem to have any benefits um, and just more risk. What if me. it was so your own that, menstrual blood is the question? Still yeah, no, same thing though. Canal, I mean, right? But it's your bacteria. Yeah, but it's your candida too. Yeah, but the too. flora in your <laughs> anogenital region is different than the flora on your face, presumably, right? So that's like saying that I'm going to, you know, not like they're the same thing, but, you know, say that you were to smear feces on your face, I think would probably, it is your own feces. You know right? what's right. sterile though? You know what's sterile is- um, Urine. Urine, exactly. So- we've oh the this is the urea take okay so would you put urine on your face would you put Dr. urine Shaw? on your face yeah would i would i no i wouldn't 
Why would I do that? It's sterile. That's the million dollar question. So like, no, I wouldn't. Urea, uh, what about breast milk? Okay, breast, breast milk. milk. Yes, because it can contain. It contains. Doesn't it contain acids like alpha hydroxy acids? Galactose. When it's is when, not it, an when acid, it's but. yeah yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not sure it functions as much as I think because it also has like your maternal antibodies. It definitely has a lot of natural healing. Not natural. I would hate that word. It has a lot of properties that can be beneficial, I think. So you could sell me on the mm-hmm. idea that it could be helpful. You could probably move me. Now, would you do it? There's the whole breast milk shortage thing. Like, could you be doing something better with it? But then again, it's your breast milk. So I'm going to sit in the middle. Would I maybe? I probably won't in real life, though. Actually, I, I know I won't in real life. <laughs> all right last up snail mucin there it is mm-hmm. that was hesitant <laughs> that was real I don't, i'm not sure you meant that i don't think you i'm gonna bring you i have a i don't lot like the consistency of mucin <laughs> I, I think he said yes to everything so far so no i, I said mean, no to I'm menstrual just, blood oh fair enough fair enough okay <laughs> and i wouldn't do urine either mess. I'm a hard yes on snail mucin. I love that. I think it's really nice. Like if in the summer, I think it's a great moisturizer. And you can mix it. Like you can dilute it. But I have some 99% snail mucin here. I will make sure to bring that to you next time I see you. <laughs> no, there's actually quite a bit of... Obviously, you know, snail mucin can't be vegan. Um, and then there's always questions about whether or not the snails are being tortured in the process of producing this mucin. Apparently, a lot of the bigger brands like Cosrx do it in a humane way. I've never been to the lab, so I can't confirm that necessarily. But from my personal experience with snail mucin, I do think it actually has a benefit to the skin. And of course, it has a lot of humectants in it and a lot of amino acids that can be beneficial to the skin if you were to break down the composition of the mucin. But I'm just talking about my own personal experience with the products. I actually find them to be quite beneficial, though they can contain allergens because they contain snail proteins in them. Dust mites. Isn't that the cross-reactivity with snail mucin? dust mites cockroaches cockroaches i think it's that there's a cross reactivity that's unique to snail mucin and uh, so it's one of those two sorry we're off the top we're off the cuff here so sounds like board fodder yeah it does sound like board that's where i live though is these random little tidbits nidbits little factoids all right so now that we've warmed up let's jump into the meat of this discussion today today we're going to talk about dupes dupes have been going viral on social media they seem to come in peaks and waves, right? So you have this whole push of dupe culture, very popular, you know, every like one or two years, it just pops up and is very popular. What is a dupe? So dupe is short for duplicate. It's supposed to be a product that's very similar or exactly the same as another product that you're using that might be more expensive. So the impetus for dupes is basically that a product is too expensive. And so a company comes along, makes a less expensive alternative that's supposed to be the same and then everyone is supposed to go out and buy that one instead. So, Dr. Maxwell, what do you think about dupes in general? So, uh, you know, I don't think I believe in them. And there are a couple of reasons why. And it, we're kind of like getting, you don't believe they they don't believe they exist yeah. or <laughs> like a true dupe. A true dupe is okay. uncommon. And it kind of comes back to the discussion. I think we started the year with this. It's the idea that uh, formulation matters. And I know some, like we talked about good molecules and how they put the percentages of their ingredients, um, but we've also seen products brought out by someone like L'Oreal Paris, where the formulation seems to supersede every individual ingredient's benefit. And then, so I I think if you look at a product like SkinCeuticals, and then you look at um, another vitamin C, like I think it's SkinDiva has a very inexpensive vitamin C with the same similar ingredients on the package. I still, even though the same ingredients are on the label, I don't believe that is an identical product. Now, could you call it a dupe? You would certainly throw that into that category. Um, but I don't, I really don't truly believe you're going to get the exact same results uh, from these two two products. Hmm. Okay. Dr. Aldaba. Even if you think the active ingredients are the same and the formulation is equivalent or very similar? Yes. Yes. I don't think it's yeah. the, quite the same. No, I sit on the opposite side. I think a lot of skincare is is overpriced. And I do think that if you have the right formulation and the active ingredient with a vehicle, I think the vehicle really matters. So if you have a dupe, I do think that the vehicle has to be of similar efficacy. But I do believe in, in dupes. 
there's your there's the keyword though that the this first word was same the latter later word was similar and i'll buy the similar for the vehicle I don't, oh well i'll buy the similar for the active in the whole product but i, I won't i don't think of the same um, but i could certainly i do believe in similar so like you take like a sinceuticals vitamin c what is it, like 120 bucks and then you pull out this laundry list 180 of, oh ouch i died a little and, and then <laughs> you forget this laundry list of i think really high quality vitamin c products in the 30 to 40 dollar range um so i think you, is it worth that money maybe not but i um but I would go similar results. So the question to you, though, how much how much better is it? So are you talking about something being at, at eighty five and something else being at like ninety? You know what I mean? Or if, if you're, we don't know. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that there's a degree of when you're creating formula when, you, when formulation matters, and this more that we talk to chemists, and the more that we dive into the research that goes on at some of these bigger labs, the more interesting this story becomes. Is that there is a degree of this ingredient with that ingredient stabilized at this temperature with this clinical study increases the penetrance of this ingredient and makes it last longer over time. Like there's so much that goes into this beyond just like baking a cake essentially and throwing in a bunch of different ingredients. And the more I learn about the skincare, the more I think formulation does matter there. It's interesting because if you go back to just dupe culture in general, what it does to brands, it seems that if you're duping upward, that it's okay. If you're duping downward, it seems to be like very unethical and people get really outrageously Wait, what's the they downward get, they really dupe? outraged by this. Yeah, yeah. Explain so that. What I, what, I, what I mean by that is that like, say for example, uh, a L'Oreal dupes an indie brand. Okay. Right. That feels wrong. Right. Because right, you're right. like, they're stealing their intellectual property. Right, right. This is like the basis of their brand. These companies have billions of dollars. Why are they stealing from a small indie brand? And then when a small indie brand dupes a larger brand, that seems to be almost heroic in many different ways. And so I think that's sort of interesting. And, and I think that, you know, intellectual property theft is sort of at the core of this, right? Because you take somebody like vitamin C, SkinCeuticals Vitamin C, where they pioneered it at Duke. And, you know, actually, Dr. Aldaba was at Duke. Yeah. And so maybe he can speak a little bit to this. But, you know, they formulated at the right pH. They did all the studies on penetration. They did all the studies on vitamin E and ferulic acid, stabilizing the formula and making it more effective. Then you have a company like Drunk Elephant that comes along and they dupe it in their vitamin C product. And then they actually get sued by L'Oreal because L'Oreal held the patent for it to be formulated at that pH with those ingredients. And and Drunk Elephant lost the lawsuit, in fact, but they continue to sell the product. And I'm sure that there's some type of licensing agreement between the patent holder and the actual you know, product distributor like Drunk Elephant is now. But what does that mean for like the culture at large when somebody puts their heart and soul into a product and then another company comes on, is able to sell it at a cheaper price and steal your intellectual property? I don't know if that would feel great if you were the, if you were the one that created that formula. I mean, I agree with you there as far as intellectual property, but also that's why we have patents and that's why those are in place. But once the patent is expired, then don't you think that the general population or the world population should benefit from it, right? Because then it goes to gatekeeping. So are we allowed to do that? How long are we allowed to do that? But I also think that it it depends on what your, what your skincare goals are, right? So is the most expensive the best for you or can you have a cheaper alternative or quote dupe? Yeah. So, you know, th that's the secondary question is, do I think it's worth it to buy this more expensive vitamin C? And the answer most of the time is going to be no for me. And anyone who follows me knows I, I'm always recommending drugstore products, affordable products, recommending vitamin C's in the cheaper price range, not necessarily saying like buy this skin, this other one, it's a dupe of the SkinCeuticals vitamin C, but buy this vitamin C, which is less expensive because it's effective and not really necessarily comparing the two. I, I right. think, I mean, I, I think it's a conversation worth having because there it's happened the opposite way, right? You have a brand like Charlotte Tilbury, um, who does makeup and 
they actually ended up suing Aldi for stealing basically their design on a makeup product and winning against Aldi because they the form was the same, the box was the same, the product was supposed to be the same, and then everyone was calling it a dupe, which kind of reminds me of the fact that Dr. Maxfield and I made a video about super goops unseen sunscreen and the Trader Joe's sunscreen being dupes of each other. And those products are very similar. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. And and I will say that so the super goop unseen sunscreen is prohibitively expensive for a lot of people because of the size of the product and the price of the product, though I still like the super goop sunscreen. So at times I feel bad about the dupe situation. But then to Dr. Aldebuzz's point, I also feel bad for the consumer because once somebody makes a great product and they make it prohibitively expensive for people to buy it, and other people could benefit from it, then someone coming in at a lower price range increases competition. I think the biggest issue we see this in is in the pharmaceutical industry right. where people hold these patents and then they make really small changes to the formulas once the patents expire so they can continue selling a biologic drug for $100,000 in the United States, whereas overseas it's much cheaper. And so there's parts of it that feel scammy on both sides. And I think that dupe culture can be very harmful for small indie brands. And can be harmful for even bigger brands too. So I don't know. I, I don't know where I fall on this one. So can we take this a step further? How about if you're talking about pharmaceuticals, like you just said, so drugs, generic versus brand name. Somebody could argue the same thing saying that the brand name has a better vehicle. Now I've heard of some people, you know, there's an Adderall shortage out there. And some of my friends say that when they're getting the generic alternative, it doesn't work as well as the brand name Adderall. And same thing for thyroid replacement and all of that, thyroid hormone replacement. Sometimes the generic doesn't work as well. But I think those are the exceptions and not the rules because I know you, Dr. Shah, you prescribe generics all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I, I certainly prescribe generics, but you know, what's actually interesting about generics versus regular the, the original drug that came out is that the original drug actually undergoes much more testing right. than the generic drugs do so you know we did find out that there are other percentages the vehicles that these things are put in and sometimes even the actual active drug being an enantiomer or uh, a, a similar a similar drug but they you know it's it could be chimeric the way that the the molecule rotates across the axis can be different, which can completely change the function of the medication. So when a new drug comes to market, they have to go through a very rigorous process with the FDA. They have to file a new drug application and that costs millions of dollars and they have to prove tons of testing of safety. And then when a drug comes on and makes a generic form, they follow something called an abbreviated new drug application, which is much shorter. And all they have to do is prove that it's similar or close to the same as the other medication. And so it's much less testing, it's much less expensive, which allows them to sell the products for much cheaper, but they never truly go through the same rigors of testing that the original does. And so I do think maybe it's marginal, maybe it's not. I do think that there is a difference between generics and the original. Even if you look at the ingredient list or the inky list, they can be the same, they may not be exactly the same. Well, here's the big problem too, though. And I think this is more a problem in the over-the-counter space. But, you know, we give SkinCeuticals a lot of credit for pioneering an ingredient. We often see in the Journal of Cutaneous and Aesthetic Dermatology and the JDD Journal of Drugs and Dermatology, a lot of brands publish their studies. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of cost that goes into these initial R and, this initial R&D. Um, and a lot of so just, companies do studies that don't get published. But if soon as we, and it may already be there, but if we continue to like green light the idea of dupes and like stealing a formula and like even heck, I mean, you see a new product comes out, it's doing well. Sure. Let me turn around in my lab. I'll get the same product out for 10 bucks next month. And it's, but like, I think if we do that, we're kind of discouraged that initial upfront inertia of innovation and also um, of testing and efficacy on some of these products because if, if someone's gonna if someone knows that their product formula is gonna get stolen right away i mean why bother test it like or why bother put into the like a legitimate test make some random small clinical study where it's a survey does your skin look better why yes it does bam clinical study it's good study right. these are good results go get your thing because to your point, they don't have to do these studies, right? right? Like especially skincare brands that are over the counter. Now, when you talk about the pharmaceutical space, that's totally different. But when you talk about your products that are available at your drugstores, none of these companies, like the L'Oreal's don't have to do these studies, right? They, they 
they just don't have to. It's not required. They the government doesn't require them. All they have to do is stability testing for three months, and that's it. So the fact that they do this additional testing is it discouraged if there is no upside and the formulas can be easily duped? That's that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. So let's talk about our favorite dupes. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> so then if we're not going to talk about our favorite dupes, then um, let's talk about products that... No, that's what's your good dupe. No, my similars, there's no similars. There's, do you, like for vitamin Cs, do you need to get the SkinCeuticals vitamin C or would you yeah. recommend one at a lower price range? Now, I'm not saying that the other ones are the same, but can they have similar benefit to Dr. Aldaba's point by being less effective? Yeah. I think that I think that the biggest thing is if you here's my rule of thumb to my patients if it works for you if it's non irritating then I would get the cheaper option the less expensive option I would say and less expensive doesn't mean it works it doesn't work as well sometimes less expensive works better than the more expensive one or the more expensive one has some ingredient that can be an allergen so unless you can see or you can prove a difference between using that one. If you use the, the less expensive alternative, it doesn't work as well, then you can try the more expensive one. That's kind of my approach. That's fair. My approach is if it hurts your wallet, if, you, if you're like actually budgeting to get your vitamin C serum, that's not the one for you. Like if you, if it do, if you don't think twice to, to spend $200 on your vitamin C serum, then God bless. Yeah, like spend a little more to maybe have a little more peace of mind that it's working for you. That, that's How about a, that's, sunscreens, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Maxfield? Ooh, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, I think the same can be said about sunscreen. The interesting thing about sunscreens is that they have to go through independent testing um, in order to get approved. So because sunscreen is regulated as an OTC drug in the United States, they do have to prove at least that the SPF level matches. And to me, the only thing that matters with sunscreen is that you're going to wear it every day once so that means you have to like the product and two that you're getting the spf level of at least 30 right so as long as you meet those requirements in my book you're you're fine right so since all of the products that come out for over the counter for sunscreens have to go through that testing theoretically they should all reach that number now we know that that's not true because there's been tons of exposés on different sunscreens that did not meet the recommended spf 30 or 50 or whatever was on the bottle but we kind of have to trust and believe that the testing was done correctly, even though we know at times it's not done correctly. So to me, like sunscreens, um, it doesn't really necessarily doesn't have to be an expensive product as long as it says that it's SPF 30 and you like wearing it. Yeah, that's where I would spend more money on my sunscreen, especially for my face to get the elegant sunscreen that's a little more expensive. Me too. Yeah. Now that's the question. Would you, when Dr. Maxfield and I have talked about this before is... It, we tend to find that the sunscreens that we like, and I think we might have talked about this in the last episode, is that the sunscreens that we like tend to be in that higher price range, the Alta MDs, mm -hmm. the ISDINs of the world. They tend to be a little bit more expensive. They tend to be a little bit more elegant, and we tend to use them more personally. But it hurts me to know <laughs> that you're supposed to wear two finger lengths of sunscreen every day, and you have uh, two ounces of sunscreen that's $40, $50 for mm -hmm. people that is like the difference between eating and wearing sunscreen. So if you can find a sunscreen in the $10 range that you like, I would definitely recommend that over something that's going to break the bank. But if you have like unlimited income, right, that's a different question, right, is like the cost sensitivity. And I think all of us are very in tune with cost sensitivity because we still, we still see patients actively and we're practicing dermatologists. So we have patients that come in that are very wealthy, that no amount of no number you throw out at them and they're going to say no to and then you have people that can't even uh pay the you know ten dollars to you know pick up the drug from the from from the drugstore right? right so because of that like i'm always in tune with like oh like i know this hurts to spend ten dollars on a sunscreen even and on the other side i know that there are people that and if you're the person who can spend whatever they want on things then get the more elegant sunscreen buy the isden buy the alt md get the skin SkinCeuticals vitamin c buy the skin better science alpha ret you know like get get the top of the top but for most people you'll still see the benefits at the lower price ranges all right what's one dupe product each well, one biosimilar what's one biosimilar product that you think is perhaps worth checking out. I'll start because so you guys have a second to like think on this. Um, 
You may not have one because it's actually, I find that the more you think about it, it's actually pretty hard to like be like, oh yeah, this ingredient actually I, I think I have out, one. But. I think I have one though. Okay. What you got? Uh, Neutrogena Hydra Boost Water Gel. Okay. I do for up. the t- Tatcha, the water cream. Oh, mm. that's nice. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have to compare those side by side and Me see too. if they're textural. So I, I would say that. alternative, right? Like something that's going to have a similar benefit, similar texture, similar feel, but be less expensive. So then I would say uh, mm. SkinCeuticals 242 Lipid and Skin Fix uh, Triple Lipid Peptide. I think that those products are similar in efficacy to me in my personal experience, but I would actually prefer the Skin Fix one because it doesn't have the essential oils that 242 SkinCeuticals has. It's mm. a good one. Hot take. Super hot. So hot. What do you got? All right. So I'm between two. Got, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll go with the one I think that everyone's got. Oh, that one's so good though too. The one the one that I think people are looking for is like the SkinCeuticals one. So that one is, you know, the vitamin C, E, Ferulic. Dermatology, which is a brand I talk about a lot. D-R-M-T-L-G-Y. Just no vowels. They're against vowels. Um, they have a vitamin C, E, Ferulic with peptides. Anything dermatology puts together really is also cosmetically elegant. It's not a cheap brand. Um, but compared so what's the price still, difference between the two cut in half it's like 70 dollars for the dermatology 180 for skinceuticals so it's still not your it's still like your upper middle class of vitamin c's in terms of price point but it has it checks the boxes and their stuff is very cosmetically elegant so that's pretty close also the elf holy hydration that's the same thing as oh as that elf holy hydration fix the same thing yeah Oh, you love the Elf. Yeah, Elf Fully Hydration Hydrate. Face Cream. They have, Elf? Yeah, they have this peptide face cream. I'm obsessed with it. I, I've had it on my shelf for years, and I just got obsessed with it this year. But you've talked about you talked about like six times already. <laughs> I know it's like guess this year, but it's a dupe for the dermatology. Product. You're like you're peptide. influencing me. Can yeah. you de-influence me now? Uh, yeah, de-influence. It um, comes in a fragrance <laughs> and a non-fragrance free version. So the fragrance version. Oh, it does. I get the mm-hmm. fragrance free one. Yeah, amazing. Okay, all right. So next topic. So I think we've all come to the conclusion on dupes here. Dupes. They're tough. They really are tough and they're very controversial. And I think that if you're promoting dupes, you have to think about what the ramifications are for the people that are receiving your content. For example, this is in the counterfeit space, so it's not necessarily the same, but (laughs) there was a bunch of influencers on TikTok and Instagram that got uh, sued by Amazon for promoting dupes. They call them dupes, but they were really counterfeit products. Um, And so there's legal ramifications for, for, for counterfeit, for promoting Mm -hmm. counterfeit um, goods is illegal, huh. um, by the way, just so in case anyone so knows. Know. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> next topic, medical tourism. Um, this is massively popular right now, um, on social media, you know, what we're, we're hearing now, and this has been going on for years and years and years. I mean, maybe even decades where people travel to other countries to get medical procedures, usually cosmetic procedures done in those countries. Now, this was something that only few people had known about or talked amongst their friends. They went over to Mexico or they went over to Turkey. They got a procedure got done. They told maybe their small group of friends. But now because of social media, this is amplified. So people are going and getting hair transplants in Turkey and then coming back on social media and talking about their experiences with these hair transplants. And so now medical tourism is booming overseas. Turkey is a major destination country for medical tourism. What do we think about medical tourism in general? And would you personally get a procedure done in another country? That's a good question. So medical tourism, just to look at the scope of it, it's 60 to $80 billion a year worldwide in medical that's the money spent on medical tourism so mexico turkey india uh, south america a lot of these places i personally would do it if the country is number one safe and if they had accredited hospitals like for example turkey has accredited hospitals by the government and medical tourism is backed by the government in turkey so I would do that and and I would have to go I would have to know somebody who's done that same procedure at that facility and seen their results. Like I would personally have to know them. I wouldn't just yeah. trust their website or something like that. I'm with you. The latter So part you go of first, Dr. Shah. If you went if you So went, yeah, that's like who's the sacrificial <laughs> right? lamb? So Dr. Shah, if you went and got a procedure, I was like, Wow, that looks good. And I'll go yeah, get my <laughs> We see so many Kodachromes though. Like remember, so in dermatology training, a Kodachrome is like a picture and you you have to know what happened, the whole story behind it, just from the picture. 
but there and there were so many Kodachromes about mostly like silicone injections, um, and a lot of those are from Mexico or Central America, and or other injections uh, or cosmetic surgeries that went wrong. But usually it's the injections because you get very specific reactions to those. So I think I have mm-hmm. a little bit of a negative bias just because of the medical exposure from these untoward reactions from medical tourism. Um, would I do it? I probably wouldn't unless like you said i knew somebody who did it it's the whole trust thing which is so funny because i think even as professionals we buy into anecdotes so hard like our friend is like hey it worked for me we're like oh yeah yeah it does mm-hmm. that's great right. Right. Yeah. study it's, you, it's, it no it really is you. interesting <laughs> you know I, I think it's sort of interesting i've been i've been doing a lot of traveling lately um and the interesting thing about it is that you start to realize that the world is such an interesting place in the sense that like what we thought of other countries potentially growing up is not necessarily true, right? Like you go to Dubai and you're like, this place is amazing. Like it genuinely is like an amazing place, right? Like just over the top nice, right? You go to some place like Turkey, right? Super nice place, right? Obviously they have places that are not so nice, but like overwhelmingly, you know, this is a a very successful, you know, country that has grown a very, very, very robust medical industry. You know, they have, I think, 660,000 people come to Turkey for medical tourism. Wow. And there's like a, a, a international organization that accredits the hospitals that get these treatments done. So I think if we step away from the Western view of medical, uh, of the medical system, because we don't really necessarily have the best outcomes <laughs> in the United True. States in general. And, you know, how we quantify these things and the way that the medical accounting is done in in this country versus other countries is difficult to tell, but our medical outcomes in this country are not necessarily that great either. And so like, I don't necessarily hold the, the idea that it would be better to get it done here versus over there. And I think it depends honestly on, you know, I don't want to pass judgment on other countries, but it really depends on the country that you're going to, right? Like if the country is pretty advanced and they really put a lot of money, time and effort into this industry, then I think that it's probably safe to go there and get these things done. Now, I think there's a couple pitfalls. One, Dr. Maxfield is saying about infections. There is, There are increases in infections, especially specifically in certain parts of the world where you can get these myco, uh, mycobacterial infections that are common with any type of medical procedure. So some of the more rare mycobacterial infections occur with implants and with plastic surgery that's done in other countries. So certainly there's a risk of infection. The other downside, I think, of medical tourism is the follow-up piece of things, that's right? True. So say that you go, you get your hair transplant in Turkey you stay there for a week, you go back, and then there's some type of complication. And if you've been practicing long enough, you know that no matter how good you are at what you do, there is always a risk of complication, no matter how well you perform that procedure. It's what you do afterwards that becomes really important, right? So if you are an injector of filler in the United States, and you've never had a vascular occlusion, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're the best injector of all time. It probably just means you haven't injected enough people because some of the best injectors that I've ever met have had vascular occlusions because people have variant anatomy. You can't predict it. The key is what do you do once that complication happens? Do you have the hyaluronidase in on hand to dissolve the filler? Do you have uh, an ophthalmologist on call that you can send them to, right? So it's so it's not only like doing the procedure, but it's what happens after the procedure. And I think one of the concerns with medical tourism is the lack of follow-up that occurs when you get that procedure done. That being said, I would say that Turkey, the results that I've seen from people I know personally um, and people that I've seen on social media that I trust um, is actually pretty incredible. And I'm not gonna lie, I would get a hair transplant in Turkey. And the reason why I say that is because they do more than they do over here. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, do you want to go to the guy in the United States that does one hair transplant a month? Or do you want to go to the guy that literally has people flying all over the world and all he does is hair transplants at a internationally accredited facility on a five-star and is staying in a five-star hotel with business class travel to Turkey for a few days? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be against it. And you know, I think it depends on the country, but I'm kind of I'm kind of pro medical tourism in the right settings. Doctor Maxfield, are you convinced? No, I'm not convinced. I you would just do don't it like too, to maybe, travel. That's why I also don't like to travel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, I'll stay home. That can be a big you See your bias. See, you have a bias. But um, Doctor Doctor Ferrer, my um, 
my dermatologist uh, partner down in Florida said just this week alone, she'd seen three, two or three women from South America who had botched plastic surgery and they're crying. They've had bad breast implants. They've had scarring from tummy tucks, abdominoplasties. So she's she's kind of like Dr. Maxfield. She's like, oh my God, because I was talking to her. I'm like, yeah, what do you think of this medical tourism thing? And she was like, no, I've seen too many too many bad cases. But I think this is a selection bias because you're going to only see the bad results, right? So in the United 100%. States, you're going to see like burns from med spas, right? You're going to see vascular occlusions. You're going to see these complications. So out of the say, like I'm throwing a number out there, let's say a hundred thousand people had a procedure in, in South America, they come back and we as professionals are seeing maybe the 1,000 that had the complication. All of a sudden, we're biased. Oh, my God, don't go down there. But I know plenty of my patients who go down to Mexico for dental work, and it's incredibly cheap. It's across the border sometimes. You just cross the border, and the physician is licensed and accredited in the United States, but they're just doing it in Mexico. So I think we just have to, like Dr. Shaw said, step away from our bias and just be objective with this. Nah, show me the numbers. Eh, it's, there's no numbers. Yeah, here. I don't think there are good numbers because I try to look into it, like whether the rates of infection or the rates of complication were higher. I think there's no good statistics on it. So I think it's really just like our own anecdotal experience with this. But I really do think that and the reason why I started off by saying I've been traveling a lot lately is because my worldview has changed significantly as the result of travel and how advanced other countries have gotten over the past like, 20 years is just incredible. And so I would not discount what people are doing in other countries because I, I just I truly think that some of the greatest innovation is happening in countries outside of the United States lately. Not saying that the United States is not coming out with great innovations too, but I think some of the stuff that they do in Turkey, they're not doing here as far as cosmetic procedures. I've seen some of the devices that they've rolled out and I've seen some of the way, the techniques in which they do hair transplant. I mean, they, I mean they're just very, very, very advanced over there. So it, it is interesting. And you have to also think about a lot of the cosmetic devices Developments in skincare actually come out of South Korea uh, because there's a lot of innovation there in the skincare space. And then we take some of that innovation and we use it over here. That being said, our medical system is very slow to adopt to changes and FDA approval takes a very long time. And so by the time we have things, they tend to be on the safer side. That's why you see things like botched plastic surgery or silicone or things that come out new over there that end up, we find out, are not great for you. And so we the, the United States tends to avoid those really detrimental things. Uh, but some of the things that are more tried and true, I wouldn't just go to Turkey because it's cheaper. Um, right. It is cheaper to get the procedure done there. I would go there because I would think that they would do a better job in some things. That's actually my thought. It's actually not to save money because I think if you just go to the lowest priced place in South America or anywhere else in the world, that is a bad way to do any type of cosmetic procedure in my mind. But I'm just saying, don't yeah, right. discount like what people are doing in other countries because I actually think some of the innovation over there is incredible. Um, but my concern is the follow up. And so, you know, getting things done in the US, especially if you're going to be traveling on a plane the next day, not smart to get something done overseas if you have no follow up. Yeah. And that's where I fall too. It's mostly the accountability thing. Like who's accountable at the end of the day? Again, it's not. I don't, I'm, I'm actually with you. I don't think the U.S. healthcare system is the most effective. And I don't think we have the latest and greatest because the FDA is that na international short step. Like, it's so funny because so much innovation comes out overseas. Um, the Americans are the last to adopt. Even in the over-the-counter space, we talk to brands behind the scenes. They're like, ah, oh, it's going to take like three years to get this ingredient into the U.S. But it's like available in Europe. And then at the same time, Europe is quick to ban too. So it seems like some of these regulatory bodies are like, oh, yeah, let's give <laughs> it a try. True. Oh, no, one study came out that is bad. Out of here. <laughs> but we're just slow on our end. That's that's super interesting that you mentioned that. There's um there's something called Profilo um that's very popular. I was talking to a dermatologist in the UK. It's a type of filler. Um I think it's super low G prime, um basically made to be injected into the dermis um to basically improve skin quality. Hmm. Um, I could be completely wrong about this. Um, this is what I remember from one conversation. So I have to dive deeper on this. Not very popular in the United States, but in overseas, apparently it's massively huge, hmm. right? So apparently this will, this will trick, this will eventually trickle in the United States, I'm thinking. Um, but, but profile huge in other countries. And so it's interesting when it comes to cosmetic procedures, when we get things before other people, and sometimes people get things before we do. Um, but that's why I think that 
everything has become a global economy in a lot of ways, right? And I'm going to the World Congress of Dermatology this year, which is in Singapore. I'm also going to the European Academy of Dermatology meeting in Berlin. And I actually think that we need to be sourcing more knowledge from the international derm community because I think there's a lot of cool things happening in other countries as well. Yeah, with you. So to sum up this medical tourism thing, and I think this is pretty controversial, we have Dr. Maxfield who is against medical tourism. We have Dr. Aldaba who is for medical tourism. And then me, I'm kind of in between, but I'm leaning a little bit towards medical tourism just because of the advancements that have been happening all over the world. You have to do your research because otherwise you can end up in a really bad situation. And a lot of these damages can be irreversible. So don't just go to the cheapest place. Definitely do your research. Make sure that these institutions are accredited. There's tons of before and after pictures. There's testimonials. There's people you can talk to because you do not want to be messing with your body and make a major mistake. So that's our summary on medical tourism. Now let's talk about the effects of Ramadan on the skin. This is something that's personally very interesting to me because they've actually done some medical studies on the benefits of Ramadan on the skin. The original intermittent fasters. So first, what is, what is Ramadan, by the way, Dr. Aldaba? So Ramadan is is a tenet of the Islamic faith. It is one of the five pillars. And we fast during the month of Ramadan, which is 29 or 30 days from dawn until sunset, which means no drinking, no eating, and not participating in any sexual activities. But then at sunset, then we can eat, we can drink, and we can be as we normally would be until the next day. It's an interesting be as we normally would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, because you're not, you're, you're not. <laughs> you're okay, not fair fasting. enough, fair enough. Okay, so basically the idea is like, how does this affect your skin? And it, it's super interesting because this is the idea of intermittent fasting. And we talked about this on a previous episode, but intermittent fasting, not eating from a certain period to another period, what does that do to the body and how does that affect the skin? They've actually studied what happens to people's skin during Ramadan, but also what happens internally during Ramadan. So during this fasting period, the levels of inflammation in the body, the cytokines in the body that cause inflammation actually decrease. This, is, this has been studied and proven that the levels of inflammation in the body decrease. What does that mean for the skin? A lot of skin diseases are inflammatory. Acne, psoriasis, hydradenitis superativa. So by decreasing those levels of inflammation in the body, it should improve your skin overall. Now, does that translate actually to real clinical studies? There are clinical studies that show that psoriasis and hydradenitis superativa are improved during Ramadan by people who are partaking in fasting. This is fascinating to me. Now, I think this is interesting because you love your ancient wisdom. And I'm actually on board with the, the whole ancient wisdom thing. I think it, like if you get me one on one, I think there's so much to talk about with this. But um, interestingly, too, we do know and not to take away anything from like a spiritual aspect here, but we do know that with both of those conditions, weight is actually a a variable that can make both of those worse so like it with psoriasis it's like a chicken or the egg and same with hs um, which came first and of course it's not just a weight problem these are like there's a strong genetic component with both but we do know that weight can perpetuate both at least in part and so i'm all for i'm all for controlling your diet i should say i'm like is there been fasting the answer for everything i don't think so but uh i do think it could be helpful but also that's a, that's a good sense. question that you're it's interesting that it's chalked up to weight. It's in, well because weight is tightly tied to you know insulin, um, insulin resistance, resistance, mm -hmm. right? And so because insulin resistance plays a big role in inflammation in the body as well, and weight gain, and also all these other contributing factors, insulin levels decrease during the fasting period as well, and so. I think that the, it, it, like you said, it's a chicken and the egg thing. Like, yeah, maybe you lose weight, which most people don't lose weight during Ramadan. At least I don't. Um, but most people don't lose weight during Ramadan. But I, I think that overall, you know, like better, healthier practices are important. There are, you know, the other question is like, what are you breaking your fast with? Because I eat a lot of fried food when I break my fast. I eat a lot of sugary food when I break my fast. So I don't have necessarily the best diet when I break my fast. I don't know about you, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Aldaba, but when I'm eating, I'm like not necessarily eating the best types of food. So I don't know necessarily that I'm offsetting that inflammation in any way, but I think if you were to eat healthy food, it could be beneficial for you. No, I, I agree. I agree. It decreases your insulin. It decreases your... Um... Uh, well, it increases your insulin sensitivity. It decreases your insulin resistance, which definitely helps. Um, 
decreasing also sebum production. So some might argue, well, if you're dehydrated or if your sebum production is decreased, aren't you more dry or is your skin more dry while you're fasting? So yes, you do have to hydrate and you would do everything that you would normally do. You can moisturize your skin. You can do all of that. But I think we're mixing things, Dr. Maxfield. Weight and fasting are two different things, right? So yes, I agree with you that obesity will have a negative influence on being a psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, all these other conditions. However, even if you are obese, if you fast, you can still improve this, right? So I do think that they're two different subjects. Fasting and obesity are, are separate. And I think you're kind of mixing them there. No, I think you're, I think it could be a confounding variable, which would be the appropriate term. Now, I don't know the study in particular. I don't know if they stratified, like did a substratification or a Hawk analysis to take out weight loss, Ooh. see if that was a bit. Because I, but I do agree um, that there are value. And we talked about this on the other one. There are values to intermittent fasting that go beyond the weight loss. I'm a firm believer of that. That's why I've done it for like a year and a half without losing any weight. Because I definitely wholeheartedly believe that it can decrease the inflammatory profile, have benefits to go well beyond weight loss for the whole body. Um, I just wonder if it's a confounding variable. So post hoc analysis, what's going on in that data? I don't know. <laughs> a nice post hoc analysis by Dr. Nice. Maxfield. Okay. I think that that's a fair, fair thing. I just think it's fascinating, you know, cause I'm a big believer in ancient wisdom. I truly believe we don't know anything. Um, and I, it's sort of interesting that we think like at this point, like, I don't know, like, I, I feel like we graduate from med school and we think that like everything we're going to know about science has already been solved right mm -hmm. like we like we solved <laughs> yeah. it all and we learned it and now we're ready to go but i think there's so much i mean even what we've learned in the last 100 years like think about where we're going to be 100 years from now i mean half the things that we believe we're probably not going to believe anymore but to me i always find this like i don't know it's this this uh weird like sense of like something bigger than me when like an ancient tradition is somehow validated by western medicine to me like it just feels like this like my two worlds colliding and I love that so much. So anytime that happens, I get really excited about it. Um, but anyway, uh, let's talk pork. about wait, pork. I'm going to throw out pork right there. I couldn't agree more pork. Like think about this pork, whether it's the Judeo Christian Islamic tradition, all of it together. Pork is this product with cloved feet. That's taboo. And it took 2000 years or so, maybe like 1500, who knows millennia until someone figured out, Oh, Hey, there are a lot of specific worms to pork. So I'm with you. I think the validation of these millennia old ideas is incredible because, yeah, maybe it's 2000 years until we look at something else and we're like, oh, maybe that was why. Yeah, but we're so easy to discount it is the problem now because now we have this like hard science based evidence, right? You're your ad hoc analysis, <laughs> and your statistics and all that, right? So you have that. But the problem is we don't have the resources to test everything. So then if we can't test it, or if we can't see it, if we can't feel it, therefore it's not true is our approach, which, which I think is a wrong approach. I think the approach should be like cautious, cautiously optimistic with all these things, right? Right. And I think we talked about this before, like as long as it's not in lieu of a life sustaining treatment, right? You're not saying, well, you know, my ancient wisdom tells me aloe vera is a chemotherapy agent and I'm not going to do chemotherapy because I believe in this aloe vera plant. Like I, I think there's a point where it gets dangerous, but I also, I, I'm also like what cautiously optimistic on some of the more natural and traditional wisdoms out there as Dr. Maxfield knows. So <laughs> let's, let's talk about um, something that's always really interesting to me, um, allergen of the year. So the American contact dermatitis society every year puts out an allergen, which I think is actually like a pretty cool thing. We should put out a something of the year too. We should put out like ingredient of the year or, you know, skincare yeah, hero ooh, of the year or I something like it. that. Can we do that in March? I, we should come out with something <laughs> of the year, the doctorly something of the year. We got to, we got to, we got to ideate on this, but allergen of the year, this happens every year. And 2023 allergen of the year, lanolin. Let's talk about it. Lanolin. So lanolin actually comes from sheep's wool, right? It's like a wax-like substance and it's used as a moisturizer, as, a, as an emollient. But, right, Dr. Shaw, 
yeah no looking it's uh me, you're, you're looking kind of uh interested there. <laughs> no no no. it is it is you just de- i'm more interested me. in what dr maxfield is doing right yeah. now like he's like texting people he he's on tinder like i don't not really sure like what's going <laughs> well, on the benefit on of screen. having the additional person he's talking, fidgeting yeah well now my microphone <laughs> fell off again but the, the you need a fidget spinner yeah yeah no so anyway it, it's a it's it can be an allergen but it's also a, a very good like moisturizer so it's functional it's functional but it's it's the allergen of the year because it can cause itching redness inflammation for some people it's composed of like fatty acids alcohols and esters um and it can create a a, a good occlusive barrier on the skin let me quote dr klingman here Ooh, quote Klingman, Dr. Klingman, an Albert Klingman Albert quote. Albert Klingman. All right. So this is older, and I think this is an interesting take, because wasn't it, I don't know his last name, Matt, Dr. Matt, who had this huge thing on lanolin. Wasn't that his Hughes. Product? Matt, yeah, Matt Hughes. Hughes, Dr. Hughes. Wasn't that it with Cetaphil? Yeah. No, no, like, no. He was fragrance. Was it was like linalool. Oh, it was linalool. Yeah, okay, yeah. forget it. Then back to Klingman. Back to Klingman. So quote, quote, it's interesting. <laughs> The quote, in fact, lanolin is at most a weak contact allergen. The supposed hazards of sensitization, dot, 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 are a resultant resultant of a faulty science and failure to appreciate the limits of patch testing. Lanolin allergen is a myth created by overzealous professional patch testers. No one has succeeded in sensitizing animals or humans to wool, wax, alcohols. Most of the case reports are false positives in association with the angry back syndrome. He's a controversial person. <laughs> oh, wow. This is actually an incredible quote. So, so for those of you who don't know, Albert Kligman invented tretinoin. He also invented triluma, which was initially called Kligman's formula. So this guy is a pioneer, and we could talk. We have to we have to dedicate an entire episode to Albert Kligman <laughs> and the studies that he did at UPenn, plus the human rights violations that occurred at the prisons that he tested his products. Definitely a future episode. That being said, a fascinating quote from Albert Kligman. So the question is, is this again true? Have we forgotten the ancient wisdom of Albert Kligman here? (laughs) Is it in fact true that this is just truly not a real allergen? Because we use Aquaphor quite a bit in dermatology and Aquaphor has lanolin. Now lanolin has known benefits because it is a very good emollient and moisturizer. So we, there are known benefits of, of lanolin. There are known risks of, of lanolin apparently. Again, it reemerges as this contact allergen. Now, is it a true allergy or not? I don't know. That, that we're going to have to dive deeper on this. Yeah. Do you think like this allergen thing of the year that they have to pick an allergen, right? Then you start running out of allergens because <laughs> you can't like recycle them. So, so you think the just... allergen of the year is a scam? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, Last I, year's I don't think allergen. It's a scam. I don't think it's a scam per se, but I think you're going to run out of allergens. Like right. true allergens. So you're going to like pick these weak ones potentially, right? I see. I see what you're saying. I mean, I, I just, I don't actually know of any patients that have ever had an allergy to Aquaphor personally. Um, Same here. Though that being said, um, apparently, I mean, th- this contact dermatitis society, I mean, all these, I mean, these guys love patch testing, guys and gals. So, you know, I, I would, I would lean to their expertise on this. And, you know, I believe that they're probably getting true allergy allergens too. I mean, this goes back to the question, can you be allergic to pure petrolatum or pure Vaseline? And, um, a lot of derms think you cannot be. And I kind of lean towards that side though. There are a few or one or two published cases of people being allergic. And is it a contaminant in fact, in the petrolatum, isolation process that's causing this or is it truly an allergy to pure white petrolatum i don't know and i I don't know if we'll know that about lanolin here either last year's allergen of the year was aluminum chloride which is an antiperspirant and interestingly enough i actually get quite a few patients with contact dermatitis in their armpits and i always thought that it was due to fragrance in their deodorants, something else they were putting underneath their arms. Maybe it was a form of inner trigo. But after seeing that it was a contact dermatitis allergen of the year, it made me think more about aluminum being potentially the cause of these contact dermatitis reactions that were happening in the armpits, something I had not thought about before. So I think that the, the, this contact dermatitis allergen of the year 
just alerts me clinically to things that could potentially be causing problems in my patients. But that being said, I'm not sure this Kligman thing, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to lean in deeper on Maxfield. Yeah. But the aluminum chloride that you were seeing, was that an allergic or an irritant contact dermatitis you think? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that it, it's hard to tell the difference between the two, right? Um, clinically, but you know, itchy, red, um, irritated, you know, I lean a little bit more towards allergic contact dermatitis could easily be irritant. I mean, the, the American Co- contact dermatitis society had this as an allergen of the year. So true allergy, I suppose. I, you know, it's funny, Dr. Bisher. I, I actually wholehearted believe in this list. <laughs> <laughs> what list? The allergen of the year. I'm just looking at the last, uh, some of the notable previous um, allergens. Well, 2014, the contact dermatitis allergen of the year, methyl chloroisothiazolinone. Yeah, they're notorious. Um, which, yeah. notorious. Yeah, yeah. Formaldehyde. No, I'm not saying fragrance. it's a scam. Like, <laughs> you said it was a scam. I, I, no, no, I said the whole allergen thing. Pat, of the year, Pat you got to edit this back where he yeah. says it and he doesn't say it. It's going to be hilarious. Oh, my God. But listen, listen I think you're going to run out of allergens. Are they recycling allergens? No. Oh, that's Cortico- a good steroids. question. I haven't seen it. Cortico- so I see more corticosteroid allergies than lanolin. I've never seen a la- lanolin allergy, but I see corticosteroid allergies more often. Rarely, but I see them. So I, I do think that lanolin is probably less of an allergen or a weak allergen. So I, I do agree with the ancient wisdom there. But the question I, is, I does it change number. your behavior? Because this is actually an interesting question for me is because corticosteroids, which are supposed to actually treat allergic contact dermatitis, can cause allergic contact dermatitis. Does that stop you from prescribing corticosteroids? Probably not. No. So the question is, because lanolin is a known emollient, which does have benefits to the skin, which are actually hard to reproduce from other ester, wax esters and things out there, does it stop you from using lanolin? Or do you just tell people who have highly sensitive skin, like atopic dermatitis, or somebody who's actively having an allergic reaction to avoid lanolin? Or has this become a general recommendation for everybody that you treat to not use lanolin? I just use the dupe va- Vaseline. <laughs> Yeah, we do, right? I use Aquaphor. But even before this was contact, I use the dupe. The I, I, I don't even, I don't buy Aquaphor because, uh, because of, actually, I, I don't do it because of the lanolin, yeah. to be honest, because at Duke, we, we, you know, we had a, a great patch test. We had great patch testing. We had um, professors who would um, teach us about allergic contact dermatitis and we had experts in the field. So I became hyper acute and hyper aware of this lanolin thing. So the reason why I don't use Aquaphor is because of that. And also um, my my business partner, Dr. Ferrer, another dermatologist uses Aquaphor. And then I was looking at the, I was looking at our um, invoices and I'm like, wow, Aquaphor costs way, way more than Petrolatum. So I'm like, we're definitely not using Aquaphor because it does the same thing. So I'm going to use the dupe. And in this case, the dupe works. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Uh, That's amazing. So it's more of a financial motivation (laughs) on your end. Both. both. (laughs) Fair enough. Someone's got to, someone's got to maintain the bottom line here. I'm out here just whatever, you know, (laughs) I'm, I'm, you know, leaving water bottles all over the office apparently (laughs) and not, not He's not recycling. I'm not okay. recycling enough for him. And no, um, no, I do recycle. I just want everyone to know for the record. Um, <laughs> so, and I drive an electric vehicle also. Nobody, nobody correct me on this podcast right now. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Maxfield, any thoughts on that? No, I'm with you. You know, it, I think, I think the thing is just drive awareness, like you said. So I, I also just don't use Aquaphor before this was the allergen of the year. Cause as a dermatologist, it's a known allergen. Like it's in our textbooks. Like even though I brought up the Klingman thing, maybe it's controversy, but it's in our textbooks as a potential allergen. And so for me, I'd already kind of switched. I don't use Aquaphor. Rarely, if ever, do I recommend Aquaphor because I love Petrolatum. And I think it's also interesting. You've, you've widely adopted the Petrolatum enunciation. Um, yeah, I think that that's the correct enunciation. And like I've always said, ever since we started creating content, whenever I'm proven wrong, I have to adapt to that being wrong piece of it. And I, I think that it is Petrolatum um, from from... <laughs> the research I've done. So I've adapted my, the way that I speak, because I think that we all need to be human enough to realize oh that gosh. we could be wrong. Oh, okay. So anyway, 
this is an interesting discussion. We covered a lot of things today. So we, we covered did. dupes. We covered medical tourism. We covered the effects of Ramadan on the skin. And we covered the allergen of the year, which is lanolin. Um, thank you, Dr. Aldabaugh, for joining us on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Tell us where, tell people where they can find you. Well, you can find me at Fora Dermatology. And <laughs> he just hangs out at our office all day. I just, so if I you're looking up. for him, he's there. Right, right. Um, you can find me at Dr. Bisher on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Please subscribe um, wherever you are. Leave a review if you enjoyed this podcast. That would really help us out. Any final words, Dr. Maxwell? No. As always, we appreciate you being on this journey. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, all the buffers stopping by. It's always fun. Appreciate it.